Greetings esteemed viewers, and welcome to Tailingo, the channel dedicated to enhancing your English language proficiency through the art of storytelling. You'll learn English through story. Tailingo was created with the aim of making English learning both highly effective and enjoyable. If you're looking to reach the peak of English proficiency through entertaining stories and novels, don't forget to subscribe Tailingo and press bell icon. The Mouse, the Bird, and the Sausage Once upon a time, a mouse, a bird, and a sausage entered into partnership and set up house together. For a long time all went well. They lived in great comfort and prospered so far as to be able to add considerably to their stores. The bird's duty was to fly daily into the wood and bring in fuel. The mouse fetched the water, and the sausage saw to the cooking. When people are too well off they always begin to long for something new. And so it came to pass that the bird, while out one day, met a fellow bird, to whom he boastfully expatiated on the excellence of his household arrangements. But the other bird sneered at him for being a poor simpleton, who did all the hard work, while the other two stayed at home and had a good time of it. For, when the mouse had made the fire and fetched in the water, she could retire into her little room and rest until it was time to set the table. The sausage had only to watch the pot to see that the food was properly cooked, and when it was near dinner time, he just threw himself into the broth, or rolled in and out among the vegetables three or four times, and there they were, buttered, and salted, and ready to be served. Then, when the bird came home and had laid aside his burden, they sat down to table, and when they had finished their meal, they could sleep their fill till the following morning, and that was really a very delightful life. Influenced by those remarks, the bird next morning refused to bring in the wood, telling the others that he had been their servant long enough, and had been a fool into the bargain, and that it was now time to make a change and to try some other way of arranging the work. Beg and pray as the mouse and the sausage might, it was of no use. The bird remained master of the situation, and the venture had to be made. They therefore drew lots, and it fell to the sausage to bring in the wood, to the mouse to cook, and to the bird to fetch the water. And now what happened? The sausage started in search of wood, the bird made the fire, and the mouse put on the pot and then these two waited till the sausage returned with the fuel for the following day. But the sausage remained so long away that they became uneasy, and the bird flew out to meet him. He had not flown far, however, when he came across a dog who, having met the sausage, had regarded him as his legitimate booty, and so seized and swallowed him. The bird complained to the dog of this barefaced robbery, but nothing he said was of any avail for the dog answered that he found false credentials on the sausage, and that was the reason his life had been forfeited. He picked up the wood, and flew sadly home, and told the mouse all he had seen and heard. They were both very unhappy, but agreed to make the best of things and to remain with one another. So now the bird set the table, and the mouse looked after the food and, wishing to prepare it in the same way as the sausage, by rolling in and out among the vegetables to salt and butter them, she jumped into the pot, but she stopped short long before she reached the bottom, having already parted not only with her skin and hair, but also with life. Presently the bird came in and wanted to serve up the dinner, but he could nowhere see the cook. In his alarm and flurry, he threw the wood here and there about the floor, called and searched, but no cook was to be found. Then some of the wood that had been carelessly thrown down, caught fire and began to blaze. The bird hastened to fetch some water, but his pail fell into the well, and he after it, and as he was unable to recover himself, he was drowned. The End Mother Holly Once upon a time there was a widow who had two daughters. One of them was beautiful and industrious, the other ugly and lazy. The mother, however, loved the ugly and lazy one best because she was her own daughter, and so the other, who was only her stepdaughter, was made to do all the work of the house, and was quite the Cinderella of the family. Her stepmother sent her out every day to sit by the well in the high road, there to spin until she made her fingers bleed. Now it chanced one day that some blood fell onto the spindle, and as the girl stopped over the well to wash it off, 
the spindle suddenly sprang out of her hand and fell into the well. She ran home crying to tell of her misfortune, but her stepmother spoke harshly to her, and after giving her a violent scolding, said unkindly, As you have let the spindle fall into the well you may go yourself and fetch it out. The girl went back to the well not knowing what to do, and at last in her distress she jumped into the water after the spindle. She remembered nothing more until she awoke and found herself in a beautiful meadow, full of sunshine, and with countless flowers blooming in every direction. She walked over the meadow, and presently she came upon a baker's oven full of bread, and the loaves cried out to her, Take us out, take us out, or alas! We shall be burned to a cinder. We were baked through long ago. So she took the bread shovel and drew them all out. She went on a little farther, till she came to a tree full of apples. Shake me, shake me, I pray, cried the tree. My apples, one and all, are ripe. So she shook the tree, and the apples came falling down upon her like rain, but she continued shaking until there was not a single apple left upon it. Then she carefully gathered the apples together in a heap and walked on again. The next thing she came to was a little house, and there she saw an old woman looking out, with such large teeth, that she was terrified, and turned to run away. But the old woman called after her, What are you afraid of, dear child? Stay with me. If you will do the work of my house properly for me, I will make you very happy. You must be very careful, however, to make my bed in the right way, for I wish you always to shake it thoroughly, so that the feathers fly about. Then they say, down there in the world, that it is snowing, for I am Mother Holly. The old woman spoke so kindly, that the girl summoned up courage and agreed to enter into her service. She took care to do everything according to the old woman's bidding and every time she made the bed she shook it with all her might, so that the feathers flew about like so many snowflakes. The old woman was as good as her word, she never spoke angrily to her, and gave her roast and boiled meats every day. So she stayed on with Mother Holly for some time, and then she began to grow unhappy. She could not at first tell why she felt sad, but she became conscious at last of great longing to go home. Then she knew she was homesick, although she was a thousand times better off with Mother Holly than with her mother and sister. After waiting a while, she went to Mother Holly and said, I am so homesick that I cannot stay with you any longer, for although I am so happy here, I must return to my own people. Then Mother Holly said, I am pleased that you should want to go back to your own people, and as you have served me so well and faithfully, I will take you home myself. Thereupon she led the girl by the hand up to a broad gateway. The gate was opened, and as the girl passed through, a shower of gold fell upon her, and the gold clung to her, so that she was covered with it from head to foot. That is a reward for your industry, said Mother Holly, and as she spoke she handed her the spindle which she had dropped into the well. The gate was then closed, and the girl found herself back in the old world close to her mother's house. As she entered the courtyard, the cock who was perched on the well called out, cock a doodle -doo. Your golden daughters come back to you. Then she went into her mother and sister, and as she was so richly covered with gold, they gave her a warm welcome. She related to them all that had happened, and when the mother heard how she had come by her great riches, she thought she should like her ugly, lazy daughter to go and try her fortune. So she made the sister go and sit by the well and spin, and the girl pricked her finger and thrust her hand into a thorn bush, so that she might drop some blood onto the spindle. Then she threw it into the well and jumped in herself. Like her sister she awoke in the beautiful meadow and walked over it till she came to the oven. Take us out, take us out, or alas! We shall be burned to a cinder. We were baked through long ago, cried the loaves as before. But the lazy girl answered, Do you think I am going to dirty my hands for you? And walked on. Presently she came to the apple tree. Shake me, shake me, I pray. My apples, one and all, are ripe, it cried. But she only answered, A nice thing to ask me to do. One of the apples might fall on my head, and passed on. At last she came to Mother Holly's house, and as she had heard all about the large teeth from her sister, she was not afraid of them, and engaged herself without delay to the old woman. The first day she was very obedient and industrious, 
and exerted herself to please Mother Holly, for she thought of the gold she should get in return. The next day, however, she began to dawdle over her work, and the third day she was more idle still. Then she began to lie in bed in the mornings and refused to get up. Worse still, she neglected to make the old woman's bed properly, and forgot to shake it so that the feathers might fly about. So Mother Holly very soon got tired of her, and told her she might go. The lazy girl was delighted at this, and thought to herself, the gold will soon be mine. Mother Holly led her, as she had led her sister, to the broad gateway, but as she was passing through, instead of the shower of gold, a great bucketful of pitch came pouring over her. That is in return for your services, said the old woman, and she shut the gate. So the lazy girl had to go home covered with pitch, and the cock on the well called out as she saw her, cock a doodle doo Your dirty daughter's come back to you. But try what she would, she could not get the pitch off and it stuck to her as long as she lived. The End The Seven Ravens There was once a man who had seven sons, and last of all one daughter. Although the little girl was very pretty, she was so weak and small that they thought she could not live, but they said she should at once be christened. So the father sent one of his sons in haste to the spring to get some water, but the other six ran with him. Each wanted to be first at drawing the water, and so they were in such a hurry that all let their pitchers fall into the well, and they stood very foolishly looking at one another, and did not know what to do, for none dared go home. In the meantime the father was uneasy, and could not tell what made the young men stay so long. Surely, said he, the whole seven must have forgotten themselves over some game of play. And when he had waited still longer, and they yet did not come, he flew into a rage and wished them all turned into ravens. Scarcely had he spoken these words when he heard a croaking over his head, and looked up and saw seven ravens as black as coal flying round and round. Sorry as he was to see his wish so fulfilled, he did not know how what was done could be undone, and comforted himself as well as he could for the loss of his seven sons with his dear little daughter, who soon became stronger and every day more beautiful. For a long time she did not know that she had ever had any brothers, for her father and mother took care not to speak of them before her, but one day by chance she heard the people about her speak of them. Yes, said they, she is beautiful indeed but still tis a pity that her brother should have been lost for her sake. Then she was much grieved, and went to her father and mother, and asked if she had any brothers, and what had become of them. So they dared no longer hide the truth from her, but said it was the will of heaven, and that her birth was only the innocent cause of it. But the little girl mourned sadly about it every day, and thought herself bound to do all she could to bring her brothers back, and she had neither rest nor ease, till at length one day she stole away and set out into the wide world to find her brothers, wherever they might be, and free them, whatever it might cost her. She took nothing with her but a little ring which her father and mother had given her, a loaf of bread in case she should be hungry, a little pitcher of water in case she should be thirsty, and a little stool to rest upon when she should be weary. Thus she went on and on, and journeyed till she came to the world's end. Then she came to the sun, but the sun looked much too hot and fiery, so she ran away quickly to the moon, but the moon was cold and chilly, and said, I smell flesh and blood this way, so she took herself away in a hurry and came to the stars, and the stars were friendly and kind to her, and each star sat upon his own little stool. But the morning star rose up and gave her a little piece of wood, and said, If you have not this little piece of wood, you cannot unlock the castle that stands on the glass mountain and there your brothers live. The little girl took the piece of wood, rolled it up in a little cloth, and went on again until she came to the glass mountain, and found the door shut. Then she felt for the little piece of wood, but when she unwrapped the cloth that was not there, and she saw she had lost the gift of the good stars. What was to be done? She wanted to save her brothers, and had no key of the castle of the glass mountain. So this faithful little sister took a knife out of her pocket and cut off her little finger that was just the size of the piece of wood she had lost and put it in the door and opened it. As she went in, a little dwarf came up to her 
and said, What are you seeking for? I seek for my brothers, the seven ravens, answered she. Then the dwarf said, My masters are not at home, but if you will wait till they come, pray step in. Now the little dwarf was getting their dinner ready, and he brought their food upon seven little plates, and their drink in seven little glasses, and set them upon the table, and out of each little plate their sister ate a small piece, and out of each little glass she drank a small drop, but she let the ring that she had brought with her fall into the last glass. On a sudden she heard a fluttering and croaking in the air, and the dwarf said, Here come my masters. When they came in, they wanted to eat and drink, and looked for their little plates and glasses. Then said one after the other, Who has eaten from my little plate? And who has been drinking out of my little glass? Call! Call! Well I ween mortal lips have this way been. When the seventh came to the bottom of his glass, and found there the ring, he looked at it, and knew that it was his father's and mother's, and said, Oh that our little sister would but come, then we should be free. When the little girl heard this, for she stood behind the door all the time and listened, she ran forward, and in an instant all the ravens took their right form again, and all hugged and kissed each other, and went merrily home. The End Little Red Cap, Little Red Riding Hood Once upon a time there was a dear little girl who was loved by everyone who looked at her, but most of all by her grandmother and there was nothing that she would not have given to the child. Once she gave her a little cap of red velvet, which suited her so well that she would never wear anything else, so she was always called Little Red Cap. One day her mother said to her, Come, Little Red Cap, here is a piece of cake and a bottle of wine. Take them to your grandmother, she is ill and weak, and they will do her good. Set out before it gets hot, and when you are going, Walk nicely and quietly and do not run off the path, or you may fall and break the bottle, and then your grandmother will get nothing, and when you go into her room, don't forget to say, good morning, and don't peep into every corner before you do it. I will take great care, said Little Red Cap to her mother, and gave her hand on it. The grandmother lived out in the wood, half a league from the village, and just as Little Red Cap entered the wood, a wolf met her. Red Cap did not know what a wicked creature he was, and was not at all afraid of him. Good day, little Red Cap, said he. Thank you kindly, Wolf. Whither away so early, little Red Cap? To my grandmother's. What have you got in your apron? Cake and wine. Yesterday was baking day, so poor sick grandmother is to have something good, to make her stronger. Where does your grandmother live, little Red Cap? A good quarter of a league farther on in the wood, her house stands under the three large oak trees, the nut trees are just below, you surely must know it, replied Little Red Cap. The wolf thought to himself, what a tender young creature, what a nice plump mouthful, she will be better to eat than the old woman. I must act craftily, so as to catch both. So he walked for a short time by the side of Little Red Cap, and then he said, see, Little Red Cap. How pretty the flowers are about here, why do you not look round? I believe, too, that you do not hear how sweetly the little birds are singing. You walk gravely along as if you were going to school, while everything else out here in the wood is merry. Little Red Cap raised her eyes, and when she saw the sunbeams dancing here and there through the trees, and pretty flowers growing everywhere, she thought, suppose I take grandmother a fresh nosegay. That would please her too. It is so early in the day that I shall still get there in good time. And so she ran from the path into the wood to look for flowers. And whenever she had picked one, she fancied that she saw a still prettier one farther on, and ran after it, and so got deeper and deeper into the wood. Meanwhile the wolf ran straight to the grandmother's house and knocked at the door. Who is there? Little Red Cap, replied the wolf. She is bringing cake and wine. Open the door. Lift the latch, called out the grandmother, I am too weak, and cannot get up. The wolf lifted the latch, the door sprang open, and without saying a word he went straight to the grandmother's bed, and devoured her. Then he put on her clothes, dressed himself in her cap, laid himself in bed, and drew the curtains. Little Red Cap, however, had been running about picking flowers, and when she had gathered so many that she could carry no more, 
she remembered her grandmother and set out on the way to her. She was surprised to find the cottage door standing open, and when she went into the room, she had such a strange feeling that she said to herself, Oh dear, how uneasy I feel today, and at other times I like being with grandmother so much. She called out, Good morning, but received no answer, so she went to the bed and drew back the curtains. There lay her grandmother with her cap pulled far over her face, and looking very strange. Oh, grandmother, she said, what big ears you have. The better to hear you with, my child, was the reply. But, grandmother, what big eyes you have, she said. The better to see you with, my dear. But, grandmother, what large hands you have. The better to hug you with. Oh, but, grandmother, what a terrible big mouth you have. The better to eat you with. And scarcely had the wolf said this. Then with one bound he was out of bed and swallowed up Red Cap. When the wolf had appeased his appetite, he lay down again in the bed, fell asleep and began to snore very loud. The huntsman was just passing the house, and thought to himself, how the old woman is snoring. I must just see if she wants anything. So he went into the room, and when he came to the bed, he saw that the wolf was lying in it. Do I find you here, you old sinner, said he. I have long sought you. Then just as he was going to fire at him, it occurred to him that the wolf might have devoured the grandmother, and that she might still be saved, so he did not fire, but took a pair of scissors, and began to cut open the stomach of the sleeping wolf. When he had made two snips, he saw the little red cap shining, and then he made two snips more, and the little girl sprang out, crying, Ah, how frightened I have been! How dark it was inside the wolf! And after that the aged grandmother came out alive also, but scarcely able to breathe. Red Cap, however, quickly fetched great stones with which they filled the wolf's belly, and when he awoke, he wanted to run away, but the stones were so heavy that he collapsed at once and fell dead. Then all three were delighted. The huntsman drew off the wolf's skin and went home with it. The grandmother ate the cake and drank the wine which Red Cap had brought, and revived, but Red Cap thought to herself, As long as I live, I will never by myself leave the path to run into the wood when my mother has forbidden me to do so. It also related that once when Red Cap was again taking cakes to the old grandmother, another wolf spoke to her and tried to entice her from the path. Red Cap, however, was on her guard and went straight forward on her way and told her grandmother that she had met the wolf and that he had said good morning to her, but with such a wicked look in his eyes that if they had not been on the public road she was certain he would have eaten her up. Well, said the grandmother, we will shut the door, that he may not come in. Soon afterwards the wolf knocked, and cried, Open the door, grandmother, I am Little Red Cap, and am bringing you some cakes. But they did not speak, or open the door, so the greybeard stole twice or thrice round the house, and at last jumped on the roof, intending to wait until Red Cap went home in the evening, and then to steal after her and devour her in the darkness. But the grandmother saw what was in his thoughts. In front of the house was a great stone trough, so she said to the child, Take the pail, red cap. I made some sausages yesterday, so carry the water in which I boiled them to the trough. Red cap carried until the great trough was quite full. Then the smell of the sausages reached the wolf, and he sniffed and peeped down, and at last stretched out his neck so far that he could no longer keep his footing and began to slip and slipped down from the roof straight into the great trough, and was drowned. But Red Cap went joyously home, and no one ever did anything to harm her again. The End And there you have it, folks. We've reached the end of this incredible story together, but the adventure doesn't stop here. We have a variety of story videos like this one available for your enjoyment. To watch more, just click here. If you've enjoyed this story and want more mind-blowing stories, be sure to smash that subscribe button and ring the notification bell so you never miss out on our next epic upload. Trust me, you won't want to miss what's coming next.